and I'm here for the FMG Spotlight. We have handpicked important questions. Many of these are PYQs that are constantly being repeated in FMG and I think you should know them because either the questions or from the options they keep repeating the same pool of questions and we have seen that time and again uh, in FMG. So I know you're just a few days away from your exams so we won't spend too much time in the explanations but uh, there are about close to 100 questions uh, that we can go through. Um, I wanted to participate in the uh, you know chat window. I can see it right in front of me. So uh, if you know the answers type it in there. If you have any questions or doubts, put it in there so that I can respond to it and uh, we can make this in an interactive thing. Otherwise, I can go very quickly uh, with these questions uh, as well. All right. So um, without any further ado, let's uh, get started. Um, and uh, here is the first question. Let's see how many of you can answer this. Which of the following best describes Trotter Stride? So now guys, um, uh, unfortunately, ENT is a field where, you know, a lot of these names are there and we have to remember these names. These are names of doctors or scientists, physiologists or surgeons who came up with a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, issues, uh, these clinical conditions. And Trotter is one such doctor or scientist who came up with uh, main, mainly nasopharyngeal and nasal conditions. So uh, the moment you see the word Trotter, you should think about nose and nasopharynx, all right? Because you've seen the Trotter's method where you pinch the nose to stop bleeding and epistaxis. That is Trotter's method. Here we're talking about Trotter's triad. So here Akshat is saying the answer is C. So which is palatal palsy, retroorbital pain, and conductive hearing loss. Um, so Akshat, actually the answer will not be retroorbital pain. The answer will be temporoparietal pain. Uh, your other two things are correct. The palatopalsy, palatal palsy and conductive hearing loss element is correct. Now to get this answer correctly, you need to understand that this is a problem that is seen in nasopharyngeal carcinoma when it invades this space called sinus of morgagni. So sinus of morgagni uh, is this space between the skull base and the first pharyngeal constrictors and this is the space through which an important structure called as the eustachian tube along with its muscles levator veli palatini uh, and tensor veli palatini along with the trigeminal nerve especially uh, the second and third divisions. so the second and third divisions of trigeminal nerve they are the ones that pass through they cause temporoparietal pain Whereas retroorbital pain is caused by the first division or the uh, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal uh, nerve. So whenever there is retroorbital pain, usually it will not be, um, you know, because of V1. It will be because of V2, V3. So here I think the answer that you should pick is palatal palsy, temporoparietal pain and, uh, you know, conductive um, hearing loss. All right. Okay, now a child with throat pain, fever and has whitish membrane in the tonsillar region which bleeds on scraping. So if it bleeds on scraping, what do you think this is a possible diagnosis? In FMG particularly, they've asked this question so many times, uh, which membrane, you know, is a pseudo membrane, which one goes, uh, you know, uh, scrapes, which one doesn't scrape out. And here, um, there's a little bit of confusing choices over here. All right. So we have acute membranes, tonsillitis, candidiasis, diphtheria and infectious mononucleosis. What do you think is the answer over here? Whitish membrane, a tonsillar region, which bleeds on scraping, which means it is a true membrane, not a pseudo membrane. Pseudomembrane will not bleed on scrape, scraping. Acute membranous tonsillitis caused by beta hemolytic streptococcus. This is a pseudomembrane. Okay, this will not bleed. So here, uh, Akshat, you are right over here. So diphtheric tonsillitis is correct. Diphtheric tonsillitis produces a true membrane which will bleed on scraping. Now, candidiasis also produces a membrane which bleeds on scraping. But if you look at this, child with throat pain and fever very unlikely to be candidiasis clinically elderly person on uh, asthma inhaler uh, immunocompromised with a membrane that bleeds on scraping candidiasis would be a valid option child diphtheria is what the examiner is trying to check 
in infectious mononucleosis yeah manish you also right c is correct infectious mononucleosis the membrane cannot be scraped at all and this has also been asked this causes something called as a hairy cell leukoplakia leuko plakia and sometimes they will show an image of a tongue with a whitish thing this came in last just this this times ini ct they gave a question where they gave a hairy cell leukoplakia image and said which of the following the membrane does not scrape at all infectious mononucleosis membranes are not very easy to scrape at all diphtheria you can still scrape but it will cause laryngospasm spasm so it's not advised to scrape candidiasis also you it will scrape and it will have bleeding surface but the symptoms uh, the profile of the patient will be elderly immunocompromised and pseudo uh, membrane of acute membranous tonsillitis will not cause any bleeding so because this question is asked many time each of these can be an option i'm trying to bring this out for you over here okay now 7 year old child epistaxis bilateral nasal blockage after he fell down on the face on examination there is swelling around the nose what is the treatment here the key over here is swelling is around the nose they are not saying swelling is inside the nose they are saying that there is nasal blockage but there is epistaxis this is the clue over here guys if you are thinking about septal hematoma in septal hematoma there will usually not be an active epistaxis because the bleeding is collected within the septum within the you know uh, uh, you know around Hey Maz, nice. Uh, so within the uh, you know uh, the septal uh, cartilage, the space between the perichondrium, right? So there they will be bilateral nasal blockage, but no epistaxis. So here, since there is uh, you know uh, uh, there is no role for aspiration over here, there is no role of septal excision, there is no role for incision and drainage. There is some epistaxis that has occurred probably because of a fracture, uh, you know, around the nasal bone. We would probably just do an anterior nasal packing in this case. All right. So think about it. There are always clues that have to be given, and then only your answer will be relevant. All right. Patient presented earwax uh, during syringing. He developed a syncope. Very very commonly asked question. What they're trying to get to over here, like Manish uh, is saying. Manish, I think you are answering for this question or the last question. Um, so patient uh, undergoes syringing and then develops syncope. Stimulation of which of the following nerve is responsible for this? All right. So this is a very uh, commonly asked question, and the point that they're trying to say is there is one particular nerve where we as doctors have to be very careful when we are examining the ear area, and uh, that is the Anybody? Any guesses? It's a very straightforward question. The Arnold's nerve. That's correct. So you know the option number C, which is the auricular. This is the auricular branch of vagus nerve. It is the auricular branch of vagus nerve, and this nerve uh, is basically there, um, presenting on the posterior wall of the external auditory canal. and this nerve if it is triggered vagus is a parasympathetic nerve if you trigger it first symptom is cough <coughs> if the patient is coughing you stop the examination if you continue patient will faint and then you have to give atropine and all of these other stimulants um auricular temporal nerve is usually for referred otalgia okay especially for referred pain from parotid to the ear cauda tympani supplies taste to the anterior two third of the tongue jacobson's nerve is a nerve that goes from the promontory in the middle ear down into the um you know floor of the uh, middle ear all right so that is the relation now this is a bit of a tricky question i'm going to spend some time over here uh, because different people give different answers uh, to this um so a patient with csom okay presented with rene's test positive what does rene's test positive means it means air conduction is better than bone conduction which means the middle ear conductive pathway is normal so patient has some sort of discharge from the middle ear but the rene's test is positive so no middle ear but fistula test is also positive which means that there is a connection between the labyrinthine area and the middle ear causing vertigo okay so fistula test is when you keep pressing the tragus like this patient will have vertigo that means pressure changes in the middle ear are carrying into the inner ear into the labyrinthine system so there is a patient is having a labyrinthine fistula now what the examiner is trying to say is patient refuses treatment nahi karayega ilaj nahi chahiye i don't like the doctor comes back after 2 months this time the fistula test is negative 
This time fistula test, fistula sign is negative. So what is the tuning fork test finding in this patient? Now guys, let me tell you three of these four options. It is possible to be correct. What, but why is this examiner giving this history will tell us what option we should choose. Now, what is a false negative Rene? A false negative Rene is basically saying that when the air conduction is not better than bone conduction, but actually air conduction is better than bone conduction. That's what false negative means. You will see a false negative Rene when there is profound, profound sensory neural hearing loss. In profound sensory neural hearing loss, technically air conduction is better than bone conduction. But when this ear is dead, let's say right ear is dead, you cannot hear anything. The opposite side cochlea is giving the sound, making you feel that the air conduction is better than bone conduction and then you will feel that it is a negative renaise in profound sensory neural hearing loss. But here what they are saying is, what is it? Is it a true negative, true positive or false positive Rene? Now here basically the examiner is trying to say is that there is cholesteatoma. That is what they are trying to say because only when the cholesteatoma is sitting on the fistula can a positive fistula become a negative fistula because something has to block that opening. So they are trying to say this is an unsafe ear. This is a destructive ear. So either the hearing loss will be mixed or it will be conductive. But since they are trying to, they are not telling whether it is safe or unsafe CSOM over here. They are saying it's unsafe CSOM over here. So the answer can be either a, a false positive Rene or a true negative Rene. Now, which one to choose? I think over here, since they're saying that first it was positive and now it is, uh, you know, um, now because of the cholesteatoma, there would have been destruction of the ossicles and all of that. I think what the examiner wants us to say that it is a true negative Rene, which means air conduction is not better than bone conduction because of destructive cholestatomatous disease. Okay, tricky question here, but you have to think of the application of it and what the examiner is trying to say and get these answers. All right, child present with history. This one has come many times. At least this is the fourth time that it's coming in FMG. All right, they will show one coin like this. They will ask various questions about it. Like here they've asked, what is the possible site of foreign body impaction? Sometimes they ask, what is the next line of management? So here they are basically trying to tell the anatomy that when you are looking at, at the neck in the cross section, you will see that the tracheal cartilage is C-shaped and the esophagus which is behind is like a collapsed thing. So now if you put a coin, the coin in the trachea will normally go anteroposterior and a coin in the food pipe will go lateral like this. So when the coin is like this, then in the side view, let's say, see, suppose if I take the x-ray from this side, then on a head-on posterior anterior, I will see the, the coin as a circle. I will see the coin as a circle in anteroposterior x-ray. But when I do a side view x-ray from the of the food pipe, I will see it like this. So it is esophagus. All right, so that is correct. Adarsh has told the right answer. What is battle sign? Very, very commonly asked. Each of these four are a sign. Battle sign is basically of, of the skull base fracture uh, and that is basically ecchymosis of the mastoid. So behind the ear, you will see redness. Periobitally ecchymosis is called raccoon sign. Blood collection behind tympanic membrane is called hemotympanum. And pitting edema on mastoid is called Gressinger sign. Gressinger. It is one of the blockages of the emissary veins of the mastoid causing edema around it. Uh, and it is also seen in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. So here it is ecchymosis, which means blood. Blood collection. So Manish Raj is correct over here. Um, which of the following is true about Little's area? Little's area is a common uh, area for bleeding. Uh, so here Kesselbach's plexus is present in Little's area, which is already correct. It is not present on lateral wall of the nose. It is present on septum. It is present on the septum. It is present in the posterior part. No, it is present anterior. It is and it is rare. It is most common. All right. So this is the Kesselbach area. This is a very straightforward uh, question. Sometimes confidence boost ke liye. examiners can ask simple, simple questions, but there will always be two or three 
uh, out of the 10 15 questions that may be asked uh, that will be the deciding factor where your marks can go up and down all right so yeah um, akshat is correct adarsh is also correct a is the answer we won't waste much time on it patient present with pulsatile tinnitus the moment you see the word pulsatile tinnitus there is basically only one clinical condition uh, where you know you think that the uh, you know what the examiner is pointing to there is a reddish mass behind the tympanic membrane what is the possible um, diagnosis so guys what do you think it is reddish mass behind so dr peak is giving a thumbs up so a reddish mask uh, mass which is behind the tm here it will be glomus tumor you are lucky that they have not given you uh, let's say if they would have given you with the same thing they would have given you an option of glomus tympanicum glomus uh, uh, glomus jugular and glomus tumor and then they'll give you something like uh, uh, osteoma here the question will be which of the following is the diagnosis except right because glomus tympanicum is coming from the promontory glomus jugular is coming from the floor and both of these are types of glomus tumors they all will cause pulsatile tinnitus but symptoms are different glomus tympanicum cause facial nerve palsy glomus jugular will cause 9th 10th 11th 12th cranial nerve palsies glomus jugular will have intracranial spread this will not have intracranial spread but both will have pulsatile tinnitus your rising sun sign is seen in glomus jugular that is sometimes that they can ask you so just remember that glomus tumor is just a broad name but there are subtypes and those subtypes are also commonly asked now 14 year old boy the moment they say adolescent boy uh, with reddish nasal mass profuse epistaxis and proptosis what is your diagnosis it is a very very common classical um, you know question that is uh, asked and this is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma juvenile bhi hai and juvenile age group is there so here basically the examiner is giving away the answer to you but there are a lot of questions asked around juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma that you should know one is what is the site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma does somebody know what is the site of origin where does jna originate from so nasopharyngeal carcinoma originates from the fossa of uh, rosenmuller this fossa of rosenmuller are the spaces that are there behind the torus tuberis near the eustachian tube opening in the nasopharynx but where does the juvenile nasopharyngeal uh, angiofibroma originate from does anyone know that from the anterior lip of the sphenopalatine foramen so just superior turbinate middle turbinate inferior turbinate just about 1 cm behind the middle turbinate you will find uh, you know this uh, sphenopalatine foramen not the sphenoid uh, sinus um, uh, akshat Ardash is correct. The sphenopalatine uh, foramen is the one anterior lip of the sphenopalatine foramen is the uh, is the site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. They also ask why does JNA bleed so much, and that is also because of lack of elastic fibers and contractile nature. That is another question that is asked. Inverted papilloma normally comes from middle meatus, and rhinosporidiosis is a fungal disease that occurs when you take bath in the pond. and lakes all right this is a polypoidal condition so now newborn is cynos at birth baby turns pink while crying what is the management all right so this is uh, also very very classical see baby is cynos at birth baby is not able to breathe uh, at birth but when the baby cries it's becoming pink this is called cyclical cynosis cyclical cynosis very classical of a condition called what is this condition called where there is cyclical uh, cyanosis so adarsh is saying that the answer is oxygen by prongs you are saying this all right anybody has uh, but adarsh is saying megowans method but megowans method is not oxygen by prongs megowans method is correct that is oropharyngeal airway megowans uh, method is this. so this is seen in coronal atresia this condition is called coanal atresia 
इट कुड बी अ मेम्ब्रेन और अ बोनी ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन सो अक्षत इज करेक्ट मनीष राज इज सेंग एडेनॉइड नो इट इज कोअनल एट्रेसिया नाउ एडेनॉइड टिपिकली फॉर्म बिटवीन द एज ऑफ सिक्स टू थर्टीन वेरी वेरी अनलाइकली टू सी ए न्यू बॉर्न विथ एडेनॉइड मनीष सो हियर यूल सी कोअनल एट्रेसिया इज अ डेवलपमेंटल थिंग वेर certain membrane uh, behind the uh, you know uh, behind the nasal cavity between the end of the nasal cavity and nasopharynx there is a bony or uh, you know soft membrane and because of that the baby is not able to breathe and babies are obligatory nose breathers they don't breathe from their mouth when they cry they breathe from the mouth or like you said mcgowan's technique in mcgowan's technique you basically take the the nipple that the baby feeds with and you make a hole there put it in the mouth of the baby so that the baby's mouth is open and it's forced to breathe from the mouth and that is also called as an oropharyngeal airway straight forward now 6 year old child see look here manish 6 year history of mouth breathing high arch palate failure to thrive hearing loss here your answer of adenoids becomes correct usually between 6 to 13 years of age you will have adenoids um now your treatment over here what will you do is your management would you remove the adenoids would you make a cut on the uh, tympanic membrane remove the tonsils or adenoidectomy with grommet insertion what do you think is the answer over here so manish is saying uh, b adarsh is saying d see the answer is adenoidectomy with grommet because they are mentioning hearing loss and because they are mentioning hearing loss the eustachian tube is blocked the eustachian tube so you guys are right manish akshat everyone is right so when the adenoids are there they block the eustachian tube to the middle ear and the adenoids will sit and it will block it so that's why you have to remove the adenoid and also aerate the middle ear by placing it so dr pk is also correct so you put the grommet inside the grommet will be there for 3 to 6 months and that grommet is nothing but a ventilation tube so if this is the eardrum there will be a ventilation tube one way like this one way like this and all the pus will come out by the time the healing completes this will come out from on its own within 3 to 6 months diphtheria very commonly diphtheria teen se char bar matlab every second exam diphtheria is asked some way or the other for kids develops right vocal fold palsy what will be the management vocal cord vocal fold is the same thing sometimes people call it true cords false cords some people call it true folds false folds they are synonymous all right here patient with diphtheria has developed vocal fold palsy what will you do wait gel foam you will do thyroplasty or you will do fat injection what is it that you will do all right so think about it guys it is an infection caused by an organism organism called cornibacteria diphtheriae so once the infection is there that infection is causing the the palsy once you treat it's a treatable disease so you're not going to do anything you know you're basically going to wait and watch okay uh, and uh, right vocal fold palsy the other vocal fold is there so there is no strider or anything like that there is no aspiration so you can manage it uh, and wait and watch till the diphtheria antitoxin starts taking the effect and the patient is fine all right now like thyroplasty thyroplasties are basically uh, surgeries that are done to either medialize or lateralize or lengthen and shorten like thyroplasty type 1 this is the the vocal cords right so thyroplasty type 1 you will uh, medialize you will bring it inside and in type 2 you will lateralize the vocal cord in type 3 you will shorten the vocal cord in type 4 you will lengthen the vocal cords so type 3 type 4 of shortening and lengthening is done for sex change procedures because when you lengthen the vocal cord the voice becomes a lot more tonality and when you make it smaller it shorter it becomes more bassy whereas medial and lateralization is done to treat uh, basically um, you know this thing so like akshat is asking when is gel foam injection and fat injection done gel foam injection and fat injection is a kind of medialization approach so let's say somebody is having aspiration somebody is drinking something and they are coughing and you can do gel foam injection to bring it medially there is a particular condition called as sulcus vocalis in sulcus vocalis inside the vocal cord there is a cleft there is a gap there and because of that gap people are not able to talk properly they are having lack of clarity of speech and they uh, the, their voice gets tired very soon you can inject gel foam and fat inside that 
uh, cleft area, that fissured area, area, and you can improve that thing. So gel foam injections are given inside the vocal cord, sometimes to medialize, sometimes to treat condition called sulcus vocalis. All right. Now, what is this instrument used for? It's not seen very clearly. It's slightly blur. Uh, it is more like a punch. So this side is looking like this, actually. It's looking like this and you can punch. You can punch things. And this is a treatment that is an instrument used for dacrocystorhinostomy. Okay, and it is um, called as a kerisons punch. It has a name. Kerisons punch. I have not seen a fascination for endo DCR or dacrocystorhinostomy uh, in other exams like NEET exams and uh, in INICTs. But FMG, for some reason, they are interested. I've seen this at least three or four times. They will ask something related to endo DCR. Either they will talk about Krigler's maneuver or they will talk about massage or they will talk about some of the other blockage of the nasolacrimal duct or this instrument. So here all of you are correct. It is an instrument for dacrocystorhinostomy. Won't waste much time. Identify structure marked in the image below. Very straightforward anatomical question. No need to uh, waste time over here. This is basically the thumb shape epiglottis that it is uh, marked to. So this is epiglottis. We all know the anatomy. We won't waste time on this. Now, Mucormycosis, there are usually some questions that are asked, especially after COVID, mucor has come into the limelight and there are some questions that are asked around uh, mucormycosis. So mucormycosis will affect more in pregnancy, diabetes, childhood or leukemia. Uh, now, if you are looking at just immunocompromised uh, condition, uh, then uh, you are basically going to look at uh, out of these all three conditions like at least pregnancy, diabetic ketoacidosis, leukemia are all immunocompromised. But why like see Rohan, Manish, Anil, Akshat, you're all choosing diabetic ketoacidosis. What makes diabetes so special as a connection for mucor? In leukemia also there is immune compromisation. In pregnancy also there is immune compromisation. In children also sometimes may not have very good uh, immunity. Why only in diabetic ketoacidotic state? In diabetic ketoacidosis, there is a lot of free iron. Free iron. This free iron along with excess of glucose available, the combination of this allows mucormycosis to thrive. Mucormycosis is a normal commensal. It is already there inside us. But the free iron uh, that is there because of the breakdown of the cells, hemoglobin breaks down, a lot of iron is there. The breakdown of the cells basically causes mucormycosis. Mucormycosis, the other question that they typically ask is whether it is a septate hyphae or aseptate hyphae. So if you see sugar makes better environment for proliferation of fungus, that is correct. One of the reasons. But the other main reason is that there is also iron, free iron available. And then there is immunocompromised state. So there is not much, uh, you know, uh, defense that is there. This mucormycosis is an aseptate hyphae. Most people think septae means branches. Septes don't mean branches. Hyphae means branches. So what is this aseptate? So aseptate means, see, these are septae. The septae. Septates are this demarcation. Nasal septum demarcates. It makes two cavities. Septae is what divides into two. Okay. So this, this is aseptate. It does not have anything. It will not have any septae. And the hyphae will be at... 90 degrees okay it will be at 90 degrees that is for mucor when there are septate hyphae and the branching is at an acute angle then that is aspergillus that is the difference between the two okay septate hyphae acute angle branching a septate hyphae at 90 degree branching this is another question that is commonly asked covering it over here all right identify the sign shown in the image below and which condition are you basically going to see this so there is a homan miller sign maxillary sinusitis phelps sign or liar sign what do you think is the sign that you can see over here <clears throat> yeah 
Homan Miller sign. All right. Yeah, so most of you are saying Homan Miller sign. So it is Homan Miller sign. Homan Miller sign is the anterior bowing. As you can see here, it is posterior bowing or straight anterior bowing of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus due to juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. And that is Homan Miller sign. What is Phelps sign? Does anyone know what Phelps sign or liar sign is? Phelps sign and liar sign are both seen in the same condition. Do you know what Phelps sign and liar sign is? Phelps sign and liar sign. So somebody saying uh, Homan Miller, some ju juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. But Phelps and liar sign is seen in what? Also very commonly asked, Phelps sign is a CT scan finding in glomus tumor. So there is a crest, bony crest between the jugular vein, jugular bulb and the internal carotid artery. When this disappears, when this crest disappears between jugular bulb and internal carotid artery, then on CT scan that is called as the Phelps sign. Liar sign is seen in a jugular tumor at the carotid tumor uh, area. What happens is the internal carotid arteries and the external carotid arteries, they give more gap. Because of a carotid body tumor, these blood vessels are going away from each other. This flaying away on angiography, in, uh, on angiography when they flay away, this is also glomus tumor of the carotid body. So carotid body tumor, you see the flaying away of the carotid vessels in uh, uh, angiography then that is liar sign. Phelps sign is loss of the crest between jugular bulb and internal carotid artery. The, each of these can be an independent question. All right. Now here again, very simple infant presented with inspiratory strider, omega shaped epiglottis. What is the most likely diagnosis? If you see an omega shaped epiglottis, what is the most likely diagnosis over here? Laryngomalacia, laryngocele, Rohan Jos is saying uh, laryngomalacia. Any other question over here? Akshad is saying. Yeah, so laryngomalacia. All right, in epiglottitis, you will see thumb sign. Thumb sign. You will see the thumb sign on, on the x-ray. In laryngomalacia, because the larynx is so flexible, this becomes omega-shaped and uh, in laryngocele, they will always, whenever the word laryngocele comes or a question on laryngocele comes, they will give something about a trumpet or some blowing activity. And in laryngeal, in croup, you will, they will give a question where first it is inspiratory strider and then it becomes biphasic. I'll tell you uh, a very easy way, a simple way to remember these uh, strider. Yeah, so st a steeple sign in croup is also seen where the shoulder is, you know, become, uh, when you see the, uh, the, the um, you know, uh, trachea, uh, the angle of the shoulders go away. Uh, so steeple sign is also uh, correct, which you will see in uh, croup. Now, how do you know whether it is inspiratory strider or expiratory strider? So we have, so we have three parts over here. We have the subglottis glottis and epiglottis or supraglottis actually. Now, how is the strider happening? Okay, how do you remember which supraglottis, glottic or subglottic causes what strider? Now, whenever air goes through a narrow path, okay, whenever air is going to go through a narrow path, what it does is the Bernoulli's phenomenon occurs. And like, for example, when we are breathing inside, if there is a narrowing in the upper part, then there is strider on inspiration. So when we are breathing, <coughs> just that inspiratory strider is always going to be supraglottic. And when if the narrowing is in the subglottic or tracheal region, then the direction of the flow is opposite. The air, when it is going out, that is when it faces the resistance. So you have expiratory strider in subglottic. So you will have... And glottis, because the space is so narrow, just two to three millimeter gap, 
between the two uh, areas of the glottis, rima glottis, you will see biphasic strider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to remember. Uh, in croup, what happens is first the uh, infection starts supraglottic and then it becomes glottic. So you first have inspiratory strider that becomes uh, biphasic. Okay. Otherwise, you can tell the location by inspiratory strider is always supraglottic, expiratory strider is sub subglottic or trachea and glottis is biphasic. Now, another thing here I would like to correct before you quote me, one centimeter below the glottis is also called subglottic area and in subglottic area also you see biphasic strider. What I mean by this subglottic means, I mean the other area, the trachea, the, the bronchi, those uh, alveoli, those areas, all right? Not just that subglottic, which is a technical area, which is one, one centimeter below or one millimeter below the glottis. All right. 45 year old male presents with history of acne rosacea and uh, following findings are seen in the image. What is the most likely diagnosis? This people who have a lot of sebaceous gland, uh, you know, issues, this acne uh, problem that is there. This acne rosacea, they develop this condition called as rhinophyma, where their nose basically looks like this. It looks, you know, uh, you know, like a cauliflower kind of thing. So it's rhinophyma. Carcinoma of the nose, uh, most common site for basal cell carcinoma of the nose. So basal cell carcinoma of the nose is the lateral wall of nose, especially this area. This lateral part of the nose, basal cell carcinoma. If they show you an image of a lesion, especially rolled out, averted edges, somewhere on the lateral aspect of the nose, that will be carcinoma of the nose. Rhinosporidiosis, they will give you a history of taking bath in the pond or some water exposure because the fungi, Rhinosporidium seabury, seabury is present there. Yeah, so Manish is saying correct. Potato nose is also another word for rhinophyma. Rhinoscleroma is caused by Klebsiella. This causes a woody nose. So Rhinoscleroma is a woody nose. Okay, these are polyps. This is strawberry nose. So strawberry nose, woody nose, um, and also all of these are potential questions. Yeah, Rohan is correct. It's hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland. Manish, hot potato voice is different. This is a potato nose appearance. Hot potato voice is seen in a condition called Quincy. Quincy is nothing but peritonsillar abscess. In peritonsillar abscess, the voice becomes hot potato, it becomes like this because you cannot speak, there's not much space, there's a lot of swelling and edema. All right, that is hot potato voice. Here, there's nothing to do with voice. Here, it just looks like a potato or many people believe like cauliflower. All right, so that's how the word rhinophyma, phyma means irregular. So that is not hot potato voice, just clarifying it over there. All right, now patient with road traffic accident presents with blood mixed discharge producing this kind of uh, blotting. So you see one layer of blotting here, which is of blood. And then you see this clear fluid blotting, which is here. So you're seeing a double halo sign. Yeah, Manish, you're right. You will see deviated uvula uh, in that case. Actually, you know, you will see deviated uvula in parapharyngeal abscess. Sorry to keep correcting you, but it is confusing. Um, in parapharyngeal abscess, what happens is the uvula will deviate, but also the tonsillar pillars will move towards one side when there is parapharyngeal abscess. So in Quincy, normally uh, there will be more uh, of hot potato voice that is there. Here, halo sign. So this is very, very straightforward because of the CSF fluid and the blood. Uh, teardrop sign is, uh, is uh, you know, seen in, uh, there are multiple conditions which describe teardrop sign in uh, radiology. Uh, one of them, even in ASOM and even in certain sinusitis. Schwartz sign, you know, Schwartz sign. Schwartz sign is flamingo pink. Flamingo pink TM seen in otosclerosis. Okay. This is seen in otosclerosis. Crescent sign is seen in multiple conditions. There, there is also CSOM when the annular ring is involved and all of that. So these are little non-specific teardrop and crescent, but Schwartz is for otosclerosis only seen in 10% of cases. Fracture of orbit 
you will see teardrop sign which is um, also correct uh, by akshat so that's why because there are multiple teardrops and multiple crescents it's unlikely they will give that as a actual answer they can give it as options uh, but halo sign is very straightforward because of the csf going and uh, the the blood remaining in two different uh, levels when you put it on a tissue on this uh, uh, starch paper now this test guys identify the test cheek is pulled on one side to open the valve and this test is used to identify most significant site of nasal obstruction limen nasi limen nasi is uh, the name of the valve of the nose so to open the limen nasi which you can also do if you just do uh, this a little bit you will suddenly feel your breathing is much better that means your nasal valve was occluded so this is cottel's maneuver which you are correct akshat is saying cottel rohan is also saying cottel this is very very similar hemlich's maneuver is when you somebody is choking and you go behind them and you press and try to evacuate the foreign body which is stuck in the upper airway okay yeah this is a nasal patency test is cottel maneuver hemlich's is to do epley's and simons are both for bppv and it's posterior canal posterior semicircular canal okay both epley's and simons are for posterior uh, semicircular uh, canal so okay somebody else has joined ssy so this also right cottle sign and maneuver so good guys nice engagement to thoda maza bhi aata hai otherwise no fun all right now a patient present with bilateral neck swelling temporoparietal neuralgia and unilateral hearing loss what is the most likely diagnosis so remember this question has repeated so many times and now you know temporoparietal not retroorbital okay retroorbital is not temporoparietal is with the second and third division of trigeminal um, nerve so what is the most likely diagnosis what are we talking about here it is the same topic in fmg same topic ko leke they just keep twisting it around that's why i think these mcqs will more more or less make it you know uh, you know easy for you to sail through um so akshay dubey ssy is my best friend good you have a good friend till now let's see um so here you are saying nasopharyngeal carcinoma rohan and akshat which is correct because this is trotter's triad which was also the first question we took today trotter's triad sinus of morgagni the space between the skull base and first pharyngeal uh, you know um, the constrictor that space has the eustachian tube trigeminal nerve and the uh, levator valve palatini and tensor valve palatini buzz light years also here so nasopharyngeal carcinoma is correct won't waste time child presented with nasal discharge nasal obstruction recurrent U urti mouth breathing high arch palate this is very very simple already basic we have already talked about the treatment of it adenoids come between the age of 6 to 13 and they provide fine they form this adenoid phases the reason for the adenoid phases is because of improper airway and oxygenation the ossification of the facial bones alters so normally all the facial bones have to ossify at a particular speed but because of the variation in oxygenation the ossification speed changes and sometimes this teeth start coming out the palate starts arching and all of those things start occurring uh, in adenoid hypertrophy so very basic question we move ahead now 3 year old child 3 year old child inspiratory strider inspiratory means what i just told you inspiratory means inspiratory supraglottic glottic or subglottic or infraglottic area which is it so inspiratory strider means what right inspiratory strider is supraglottic so patient is diagnosed with croup all of the following are responsible for it except so what do you think is the answer for this guys yeah so buzz light is correct supra there is a lag so that's why you may see my response a bit later so what is the answer for this question according to you See these are all respiratory viruses para influenza influenza para mixo virus causes measles influenza para influenza causes most of your uh, you know uh, this thing conditions this pneumocystis gerovaceae is typically seen in aids it's uh, in the final stages of hiv uh, pneumocystis gerovaceae uh, is one of those uh, 
very untreatable um you know uh, pneumonias that are caused uh, by it so three year old child he is diagnosed with croup so all of the following can be responsible for it except would be pneumocystis gervaisii very unlikely to see a child with pneumocystis uh, gervaisii infection now paramyxoviruses also can cause respiratory problems and cause uh, croup so in these options if they are given over here uh, which of the following is all except pneumocystis gervaisii has a lesser chance or probably not a possible chance at all compared to these three things while as paramyxovirus has a lesser chance compared to para influenza and influenza but still paramyxovirus is an upper respiratory virus uh, that can still cause uh, you know croup uh, in some form or the other so that's why in this case it would be pneumocystis gervaisii which is a lung infection seen in aids and hiv which is not usually seen in 3 year old ch children uh, who have uh, in inspiratory stridor and cough they are pointing towards influenza so influenza would usually be one of these influenzas or paramyxo viruses all right now which of the following conditions will show a decrease in bone conduction in pure tone audiometry all right so very simple basic question of audiology generally fmg not too many complicated questions come uh, you know uh, related to audiometry but this is just testing your very basic fundamental uh, over here so which will show a decrease in bone conduction where will you see decrease in bone conduction in this particular case yeah okay i think the lag is too much so i'm not going to wait see when you are doing uh, the tuning fork test the tuning fork uh, test oh, why are you guys crying okay um now tuning fork test uh, basically what it is doing is when you strike a tuning fork and you place it on the skull all right when you are placing it on the skull it is stimulating the cochlea so generally what happens is the bone conduction is always testing cochlea this is the basic principle of it all right we sometimes get confused with the word bone conduction because we think bone conduction is the ossicles that's why i feel that this air conduction bone conduction nomenclature itself is not correct agar mere hath mein hota if i had to rewrite the ent i would call it bone uh, i would call it cochlear conduction and ossicular conduction then there would be no confusion because whatever we are doing when we are placing the uh, tuning fork on the bone of the body when we are placing it on the skull we are always testing the vibration directly to the cochlea we are bypassing the ear we are bypassing the ear canal tympanic membrane and the ossicles we are directly stimulating the cochlea so bone conduction is always testing cochlear pathology all right your fixation of stapes your tympanic membrane perforation and your these three are all your air conduction your tuning fork is basically testing air conduction through these things and by by air conduction the the tympanic membrane external auditory canal and stapes they are all modified to convert sound from air into the bone into the cochlea whereas the bone conduction is directly testing cochlea this is a very basic fundamental of audiology if you understand this most of your audiological questions will be very easy whenever bone conduction word comes automatically replace it with cochlea because you are vibrating the skull directly and the skull is shaking the cochlea by bypassing the eardrum ear canal ossicles when you are placing the uh, the tympanic membrane in the air then you are triggering the ossicular system and that ossicular system is these things stapes tympanic membrane external auditory canal these are all the air conductive pathway all right so if you do this it will be easy for you to understand most of them somehow the nomenclature bone conduction we automatically think bone is ossicles but bone is always the cochlea cochlea is also a bone it is in the bony labyrinth and that is where we directly listen to we have evolved from fishes guys fishes used to listen through waves then our pharyngeal arches have evolved to create the external ear middle ear inner ear because we wanted to be outgoing 
trekking people right so that's why all the pharyn- the first and second pharyngeal arch the, all of these have modified itself to create this external ear and so so this is a very basic concept guys uh, you should know this very clearly all right now treatment of atrophic rhinitis atrophic rhinitis is uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery young's operation nasal steroid spray and immunotherapy so klebsiella ozen this is klebsiella ozen liked your iatrogenic shots on uh, youtube yes thank you uh, buzz light here so now klebsiella ozen what is the treatment of atrophic atrophic rhinitis is a condition caused by klebsiella ozen and it is young's operation very interesting little story old britishers when they had a patient with uh, atrophic rhinitis uh, producing a lot of foul smell they did not want him or her to come in their parties so what this guy called young did he's like let me just close up the nose and he just tied and closed the nose and left the patient there like that even though the patient suffered a lot by it but after one year because you know of closing and lack of oxygenation this klebsiella ozen requires a lot of oxygenation and because of that it was not the klebsiella was not able to survive and eventually after one year when they opened up the nose again the patient seemed to be better so we do modified young's operation not young's we do modified young's where you know you um, in the nostril we uh, we make a small opening small opening cruciate 3 mm long opening inside the nose we don't close it uh, completely but this is all because of britishers have this discriminating thing you know um, problem is the smell am nak band kar dete hain and somehow serendipitously this fellow called young who must be very old at that point of time uh, was able to find this treatment of uh, atrophic rhinitis true about bera bera B- brain stem evoked response audiometry also called as abr because somebody was not happy with the word bera because it sounds like bhera so they called it abr auditory brain stem response it means the same thing brain stem evoked response audiometry or auditory brain stem response i don't know what the fight was all about all right what is dr pk saying is yeah lorton slanger's operation that is correct modified youngs now Bera is invasive, subjective, done only for those who are above 18, or done for sensorineural hearing loss. Very, very straightforward. Bera is testing the auditory pathway, so it is basically from the cochlea to the brain. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven waves, and these waves are basically generated, and it is done for sensorineural hearing loss. It is not at all invasive. You have to just put some electrodes on the head. It is an objective test. Patient does not have to contribute to it. It is done basically for babies and newborns. So it is done for sensorineural hearing loss. This is very very straightforward. Bera cannot identify uh, one particular uh, pathology. Is Bera cannot look at cortical hearing loss. This is also another question co- uh, asked. Cortical hearing loss. So auditory cortex. the last part uh it cannot the bera cannot do that for that you have to do uh, something called as sera cortical cortical evoked response audiometry where you pass the electrode into the cortex of the brain and then try to uh, understand it so if they ask you in bera what is the part of the auditory pathway which cannot be identified that is the auditory cortex look at the irony it only identifies the path it does not identify or it cannot identify hearing loss in the cortex for that you have to do sera cortex cortical evoked response audiometry another mcq sometimes asked in inict maybe fmg may adopt such a question all right now nasopharyngeal carcinoma associated which of the following viruses all right most cancers have a particular viral um, you know pathology underlying so here in this case uh which virus would uh cause it yeah anybody knows <clears throat> okay in the case of nasopharyngeal uh, carcinoma the culprit here is is epstein barr virus epstein barr virus is uh, known uh, to cause a lot of uh, yeah you're right rohan and akshat a lot of upper respiratory uh, epstein barr virus also causes a disease called as infectious 
mononucleosis also called as kissing's disease seen in young people uh and uh, sexually active uh, people and uh, then usually once you have an episode of epstein barr virus uh, especially these virus remains in the nasopharyngeal uh, area in the upper airway area any time they can activate to cause nasopharyngeal carcinoma again epstein barr virus also causes that condition called oral hairy leukoplakia So the common questions asked about Epstein Barr virus: Oral hairy leukoplakia is a whitish patch on the tongue that cannot be scraped at all. They can ask about infectious mononucleosis and Kissing's disease, and they have asked about nasopharyngeal carcinoma pathology. All right, so that's two, two, three trivia points about Epstein Barr virus. Pulsatile mass behind the tonsil. Name one pulsatile big large blood vessel behind the tonsil. This is very, very straightforward. It is an internal. carotid artery aneurysm the internal carotid artery goes right behind uh, the uh, the tonsil so a pul pulsatile mass behind the tonsil is uh, due to um, the uh, internal carotid artery uh, aneurysm common carotid artery is much lower external carotid artery goes lateral and uh, carotid body tumor is also uh, lower so in this case we won't waste too much time it's just an anatomical uh, question which is uh, straight forward uh, buzz light here carotid body tumors are much lower right so won't be at the level of the of the tonsil tonsillar level is much higher where the internal carotid artery is already bifurcated and gone behind the uh, tonsils all right external carotid artery comes towards the face and uh, the carotid body tumor is usually at the level of bifurcation so it won't be there behind the tonsil area okay so that is the reason anatomically laryngeal crepitus is seen in all except what do you mean by the word crepitus crepitus is you know when you hear some uh, you know air uh, escaping so suppose if there is a surgical uh, emphysema and you are touching you know there's all a swelling you touch it you can feel like this uh, paper crumbling sound what is laryngeal crepitus laryngeal crepitus is a very important sign testing of laryngeal uh, crepitus is called as boca sign boca sign okay nothing to do with any bengali word over here it is just called boka and this sign after that all right so um, laryngeal crepitus seen is seen in all except so it will be seen in all except one particular condition what is boka sign you can do boka sign in yourself right now if you hold your uh, thyroid cartilage and if you start moving it left and right you will feel a grating sound hold your thyroid cartilage and just move it left and right you will feel a grating sound that is called laryngeal crepitus and that is seen in normal people it will be seen in bronchial carcinoma because the larynx is normal it will be seen in laryngitis also because it's normal but it will not be seen in post cricoid carcinoma in fact it is diagnostic for post cricoid carcinoma because it means the cricoid is fixed it means the the laryngeal framework is fixed and how much ever you try to move it you will not feel the grating sign all right so that's why this is something when we suspect someone to have a laryngeal cancer or laryngeal carcinoma we do the boca sign and we try to feel for the grating if we feel the grating we know that the cancer has not extended beyond the post cricoid area and uh, we that means it is still remaining within the Inter, inter, internal laryngeal framework all right so laryngeal crepitus will not be seen in post cricoid carcinoma it will be seen in all other conditions dolman's operation dolare dola dolman's operation is done for what dolman's operation is done for pharyngeal pouch and there is again uh, you know uh, this space between cricopharyngeus muscle and thyropharyngeus So if you look at the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage and this is the pharynx there is a cricopharyngeus muscle and thyropharyngeus muscle and there is this small space called Killian's dehiscence through which some part of the larynx may come out like your zenker's diverticulum or you know your other laryngeal uh, you know things because of 
either uh, you know excessive trumpet blowing or whatever job uh, requires a lot of air flow to go through over here so this weak pa pa part uh, repair is done by dolman's operation sir kab tak chalega ye live uh, maybe another half an hour we should be able to close it so we'll go a little fast uh, you know if you want uh, just covering all the important questions so wherever it is very basic and straightforward we will not spend too much time and we'll try to wind up uh, in the next half an hour okay most appropriate investigation for juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is ct scan because uh, you know it is arising from a bony uh, area this phenopalatine foramen and it extends into the uh, thing one question i missed to tell about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma you might think that it occurs exclusively in males it does not it occurs only almost exclusively in males in fact it can occur in females and when it occurs in females the most common spread is to the middle meatus this has been asked and sometimes it is very easy for people to uh, you know uh, get confused because you automatically think it is predominantly male so you will but a female with a adolescent female with a runny with lot of bleeding uh, and uh, you know on the ct scan showing maxillary sinus is full can also be juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma all right yeah homan miller sign that is correct now <clears throat> a boy with history of ear discharge pain in the ear and hearing loss there was redness behind the ear reservoir sign reservoir sign is when the, the neck is more moved up the ear discharge stops and when you you know bring the bring it down the ear discharge flows reservoir sign also seen in csf rhinorrhea in csf rhinorrhea also if you hold or keep the face up the secretions collect and then the csf comes down this is very classical of mastoiditis okay <coughs> it's classical of mastoiditis all right move forward doctor in the icu april 2020 loss of smell i don't think i have to waste any time over here here the history of uh, what will be the next step it is going to be nasopharyngeal swab because we have all lived this situation and survived it it is covid so they may ask a covid related uh, question uh, you know especially for fmgs okay now patient slapped 3 days ago presents with decrease in hearing and pain following examination findings what is the next line of treatment okay guys here slight difference in opinion see generally if somebody has received an injury on the face because of domestic violence somebody has received a slap you will not see this kind of this is just an image that somebody has picked up generally you will see uh, an image of the eardrum where you will see a particular cut like this okay this is the kind of perforation you will see uh, because of uh, trauma and in that case in that case when it is like this you will do a wait and watch this such a large uh, size um, you know uh, perforation is not going to heal on its own otherwise normally in 3 to 6 weeks the tympanic membrane will close on its own even without a scar but such a large circular perforation is usually seen in csom so this is just some image as a representative that has been picked i don't think in the actual exam this image was uh, shown if this image is uh, is uh, shown uh, ragging is done must complain to nmc yeah in ragging if this kind of thing anybody has then you must complain to <laughs> nmc uh, but if this kind of thing is then you have to probably do tympanoplasty tympanoplasty is meringoplasty plus middle ear exploration but here since they are saying 3 days ago and there is uh, you know decrease in hearing and no pain uh, we will go for wait and watch okay i'm just telling you if the image is like this you cannot do wait and watch now a boy fell down while playing deviated nose however the septum was found to be normal this is the x ray findings of the patient what is the next step what do you see in the x ray i don't think you can see it very clearly but you can see that this bones are fractured over here so what will you do when there is a recent fracture of the nose there will be a lot of edema there will be a lot of swelling so in that kind of situation what we do is we do a closed reduction after edema subsides <coughs> in 7 days okay we don't do any open reduction 
close reduction is done by placing some sort of a plaster over here uh, you know which will provide that shape and uh, we want the edema to settle if there is swelling and you do it then the bone will fuse in a crooked manner so we usually try to do a close reduction after edema subsides we don't do close reduction and swelling will decrease automatically you have to wait for the swelling to subside if you put anything over here while there is swelling then it will not give the right amount of support once the swelling subsides you can do it even for surgery and even for uh, close reduction we wait generally for two to three days here the option they've given seven days trumpet blower boltei neck left neck side swelling which is reducible this is a laryngeal laryngo seal trumpet swelling trumpet blower the moment the word trumpet comes it is a laryngo seal okay it is coming out from there from the larynx in the side okay so this is uh, a laryngo seal it's very very straightforward thyroglossal cyst is in the midline pharyngeal pouch is a little bit uh, to the side but it will um, uh, not be related to trumpet blowing and branchial cyst is because of it remaining uh, you know the first pharyngeal uh, arch uh, it is a remnant of the first pharyngeal arch and you will have the branchial cyst that is there so this is straightforward we won't spend too much time on this patient presents with carcinoma of the pyriform fossa on laryngoscopy right vocal cord is not mobile there is no lymph node and low distance metastasis guys you must remember one thing that in glottic tumors okay glottic tumor means vocal cords it does not have any lymph node spread so usually in glottic cancers you will not see but pyriform fossa the three p's posterior pharyngeal wall and uh, posterior cricoid area and uh, pyriform fossa these are all hypopharynx or the hypolarynx okay hypopharyngeal area whenever the cords are fixed it automatically becomes t3 remember that t1 t2 the cords will always be mobile tone decay test tone decay test is related to hearing buzz light here i am not sure what relevance it has over here you can clarify and i'll answer that uh, but tone decay test is uh, basically uh, you know test done of hearing and you wait till you cannot you can stop hearing all right in this case we are doing staging and if it is if the vocal cords are mobile it will be t1 t2 if the vocal cords are fixed it is t3 and above t4a and t4b so here it would be this but t4a and t4b is if you have more than one site involved t4a will be within the larynx and t4b will be extra laryngeal so that is typically the concept approach of a tnm classification if you know the approach more or less in the options you will be able to answer it in t1 t2 the vocal cords will be mobile t3 mobile uh, vocal cords are fixed but single site in t4a t4b intra laryngeal or extra laryngeal with your mobile uh, your mobility is lost a patient presents with hoarseness of voice on examination ulcer or proliferative mass on the right vocal cord the cord was mobile there is no lymph node no metastasis so what would you do over here so when there is a such a small lesion you are not going to remove the entire larynx right you are not going to do any surgery and cause uh, you know some quality of life issue laryngeal cancers respond very well to radiation therapy and especially in these early stages if you give radiation therapy uh, the response can be very good so single modality radiation therapy is usually a good option if it is the vocal cord involvement because vocal cord pe aap koi bhi surgery karoge speech is going to be affected aspirations all of these kind of things will be affected if it was some other laryngeal site uh, like a, su a supralaryngeal area or infralaryngeal area we can think about conservative laryngectomy but here the vocal cords are involved and vocal cords you want to do as much voice preservation um doing some something like laser and all of that is not going to help with this kind of cancer so you have to most likely the uh, examiner probably expects the answer to be radiation therapy chemotherapy does not have much role in uh, laryngeal cancer unless it is just a concomitant thing surgery and radiation therapy are two uh, things that work in this particular case most common site of obstruction by of a nasal polyp is middle meatus 
okay because that is where all the uh, hiatus semilunare and all your uh, you know aeration of your frontal sinus maxillary sinus uh, ethmoidal sinuses occur so whenever there is polyps it blocks the middle meatus because most polyps arise from there so straightforward anatomical question i won't waste <clears throat> too much time on this following is the endoscopic image of nasopharynx identify the encircled site what is the encircled site over here this is an image based question we are not looking at the arrow okay this arrow is eustachian tube this is torus tubaris what is this circle thing is basically what they are asking so i'll wait for your answer What is this? Yeah. Oh, another Jagdish. Oh, I don't see too many Jagdishes. Hi, Jagdish Babu. Uh, Jagdish Babu and Akshat are saying C. Yeah, so you're right. It is Fossa of uh, Rosenmuller. Dr. PK is also saying, uh, you know, uh, C. Um, so here there is this is the fossa of rosenmuller and fossa of rosenmuller is the site of origin for nasopharyngeal carcinoma all right so that is the only clinical relevance of that particular question gold standard investigation before fes when we do functional endoscopic sinus surgery what is the test that we typically uh, do and that is without wasting any time a ct scan Okay, MRI is, is not going to give us any bony, uh, you know, uh, information. Uh, we basically want a lot of bony landmark information. We want to know whether there are abnormal cells like Haller cells, Onodi cells. Very easy to remember. Uh, so we are basically looking for Haller. And I have a funny way to remember this. Haller and Onodi cells. So now, guys, for a surgeon, if this is the orbit, okay, this is the nose. There is this plate of bone over here called as the lamina papracia. Now for us, a surgeon, we are extremely terrified when this lamina is breached and we enter the eye. That is when we say ki L lagte hain. So when double L lagte hain, then we call it Haller cell because Haller cell is an infraorbital cell. That's how I remember it because it is close to lamina papyracea, which is also an L. And if I do not see this Haller cell, then L lag jayenge, humare, double L lag jayenge. That's how I remember it. Whereas Onodi cell, Onodi, if you look at it, looks, spells, sounds like sphenoid. See, sphenoid. Sphenoid ka ODI, OID is there. So, uh, sphenoid uh, and on uh, onodi cells are seen in the sphenoid region. So with this, I'm able to remember Haller is under the is part of the uh, you know infraorbital cell. It's an abnormal infraorbital cell near the lamina papyracea, whereas uh, onodi cell is in the sphenoid uh, region. And with this, I'm sure you're not going to be confused between Haller and onodi. Then there is other thing like concha bullosa. Concha bullosa is where the middle turbinate is pneumatized. So we need to see these things, and CT scan is better. Uh, to fir, you know what happens ye lag jate hain. all right now syphilis affects which part of the nose now fmg is very obsessed with this question okay um, um this one particular concept that they want to check what causes cartilaginous issues and what causes bony perforation which disease causes Cartilaginous perforation and which disease causes bony perforation? Your last FMG may be a question ghum firke ayatha. Alright, so this is why you should know that anything like tuberculosis, lupus vulgaris, uh, and all of this they cause cartilaginous. Bony is only two syphilis, vaginous granulomatosis. They cause bony perforation and FMG is very, very interested in asking this. Kitni bar alag alag tarike se isko poochte hai log. Ki ghuma fara ke. Here also they are saying syphilis affects which part of the nose? Syphilis affects the bony septum of the nose. Because only syphilis and vaginous granulomatous affects bony. Everything else, TB, lupus vulgaris, any of the other conditions are going to be 
कार्टिलेजनस एंड ये क्वेश्चन दो तीन बार और आएगा एंड दिस इज समथिंग दैट इज ऑफ कीन इंटरेस्ट टू देम आई डोंट नो वाई बट ये और किसी एग्जाम में नहीं पूछते बट एफ में दे आस्क दिस क्वाइट अ लॉट ओके All of the following are true about patient with lip mass. Okay, this lip mass is called as a mucosal. Okay, this is a mucosal. Many times we get confused between a mucosal and a plunging ranula. So plunging ranula or a ranula is a very large mucosal that is there below the tongue. That's all it is. All right, uh, but otherwise it will be a small cyst like this. here they are asking which is which is true except okay they are asking except usually retention cyst formed due to blockage of mucus duct is correct okay so this is a correct answer uh, i mean the correct statement all right mass is usually painless brilliantly translucent is also a correct statement they are asking which of the following are true except matlab they are asking which of the following is false extravasation is not that common this is the answer actually extravasation is quite common extravasation means the fluid that is collected can also go to neighboring structures and form a larger cyst that is quite common recurrence is common after excision is also correct so the correct statement should be extravasation is common but they have put not that common so that's why this is the correct answer over here because this is only false statement pharyngeal pouch is located between this already we know pharyngeal pouch kilian's dehiscence between the thyropharynges and cricopharynges it's a repeat question so we are going to skip this and move forward patient underwent removal of submandibular gland now guys this is another tricky question okay this is a tricky question i want to see whether you understand your concepts uh, properly or not over here okay so we're going to take some time on this question patient underwent submandibular gland removal and lingual nerve was damaged which of the following is not correct okay which of the following is not correct i want you to tell me um, you know the answer to this question this is a trick question so think carefully and give me the answer to this question yeah rate of sublingual submandibular secretion is reduced anterior two third taste sensation is lost sensation in floor of mouth is lost tongue deviated to side which of the following is not correct patient underwent lingual nerve is damaged now when lingual nerve is damaged which of the following does not happen or which of the following is yeah which of the following does not happen can anyone answer this ye bhi fmg wale do teen baar to tod mod ke puchte hain Jagdish Babu is saying A. So you are saying the rate of sublingual secretions is uh, reduced, okay? And Rohan Jose is saying tongue deviation to side. Akshat is also saying tongue deviation to side. All right. Okay. Some people will say that anterior two thirds of the tongue. See, this whole question is designed to confuse you on this point because you think the chorda tympani nerve. only when the cord and tympani nerve is cut anterior two third of the tongue sensation is lost but actually the lingual nerve is the afferent and cord and tympani nerve is the efferent to the taste sensation so when lingual nerve is damaged anterior two third of tongue is also gone rate of sublingual secretions is reduced because lingual nerve supplies sub sublingual and submandibular salivary glands okay auricular temporal nerve supplies a parotid gland and sensation of the floor of mouth is also lost because of the general visceral efferent there are some sensory supplies also by the lingual nerve but tongue deviation is a feature of hypoglossal nerve and that has nothing to do with the lingual nerve the tongue musculature is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve lingual nerve does not supply uh, you know the tongue muscles it supplies a secretion of the uh, submandibular sublingual salivary glands and it is the afferent pathway for the taste sensation in the tongue and floor of the mouth so sometimes they confuse because some students automatically say sir anterior two third of the tongue is cauda tympani so that should be the incorrect answer but to anterior two third of the tongue taste will be affected when lingual nerve is damaged okay coming to the last few set of questions 15 year old male presented with nasal mass reaching up to cheek and causing 
unilateral obstruction with intermittent apps uh, epic sexes most likely diagnosis over here is very very common always the moment 15 year old with mass epistaxis nasopharyngeal uh, sorry juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma all right repeat question asked many time yeah genioglossus that's right genioglossus hypoglossus they supply the thing all right now structures not seen in indirect laryngoscopy now indirect laryngoscopy is when you take the mirror and you see which structure is not seen so when you are looking at indirect laryngoscopy you will see the vocal cords like this and you will see the cricoid and the arytenoid like this and you will see the valicula and the piriform fossa okay so this is how you're going to typically see so you're going to see the true cords you're going to see the arytenoid you're going to see the airy epiglottic fold and you're going to see the epiglottis and the valicula and this is the piriform fossa posterior cricoid you're going to see all of these structures the one structure that you will not see is all right some of you are saying uh, anterior commissure some of you are saying posterior commissure uh, some of you are saying ep uh, epiglottis i say seeing b see you can see the posterior commissure this is the posterior uh, this is the anterior commissure this is the posterior commissure you will be able to see both when you ask the patient to say a ah, e you know you will be able to see the anterior and posterior commissure you will not be able to see the false vocal cords because false vocal cords is a cross sectional structure so when you are looking at the side view thyroid cartilage this is the vocal cord this space below the vocal cords over here in the side this is the false vocal cord so false vocal cord you can see when you are doing direct laryngoscopy not in indirect when you are doing direct you pass the camera inside and you look inside then you can see the false vocal cord is a space between the true vocal cord and there is a flap below below the vocal cord true vocal cord is a space called uh, this thing of uh, uh, vestibule right so that uh, uh, ventricle sorry this lateral ventricle ke niche aata hai false vocal cord all are parts of hypopharynx except so the three p's posterior pharyngeal wall piriform fossa cricoid valicula is the one that does not come as a part of the hypopharynx so this is also a straight forward question we won't waste time on this narrowest part of the airway in infant is the glottis just roughly 1 to 2 mm the space between the two vocal cords just this much so the glottis is the narrowest oh sorry i am uh, in an infant right yeah in an infant it will be the subglottis infant it is subglottis so in the infant what happens is the uh, cartilage is still ossifying so what happens is just below the vocal cords just below the vocal cords this subglottic area will be the narrowest part of uh, airway in an infant being only 1 or 2 mm uh, you know in uh, diameter so here the correction the answer is subglottis all right now which of the following muscles is a life saving muscle in the larynx that pulls back the vocal cord for breathing to take place there is only one abductor and the abductor is life saving because when you abduct you are able to breathe and that is the posterior cricoarytenoid posterior cricoarytenoid is supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve this cricoarytenoid uh, uh, cricothyroid is supplied by superior laryngeal nerve and it is an adductor and there is a question that comes related to this which is called as uh, you know this uh, there is a particular rule and there is another question for it so i won't do it now but your life saving uh, you know muscle is the posterior cricoarytenoid which is an abductor all right now which is the causative causative agent for malignant otitis externa so this is pseudomonas pseudomonas is the agent that is responsible for malignant otitis externa so pseudomonas uh, not staph not strep not influenza pseudomonas causes it now the patient was recently got a denture fixed oral thrush bleeds on scraping causative 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 agent is candidiasis like i told you in the beginning also candidiasis also will bleed on scraping but this is the kind of profile elderly person dentures steroids inhalers and then having this kind of a thrush here diphtheria is not the answer okay now a lady comes to opd after fall from scooty look i did not make this question 
I I could have said even man comes to OPD falls on scooty. So uh, the examiner really needs to be blamed for this question. I am just selecting the question that has been asked in FMG. Okay, she is having continuous clear watery discharge from nose after two days. These are most likely the features of. This is the features of CSF. rhinorrhea all right so whenever there is an injury to the base of the skull especially over here uh, near the cribriform plate uh, or the fovea ethmoidalis is the area fovea fovea ethmoidalis so this fovea ethmoidalis or the cribriform plate area uh it causes csf rhinorrhea which is basically all the csf trickling from the subarachnoid space is coming into the nose you you cannot sniff it back you will not be sticky in nature it will be slightly sweet due to sugar content and you will have the double halo uh test when you put it on a starch paper now uh, there is only when there is blood involved then you will see the double halo okay otherwise you will see handkerchief sign which is the the it becomes very thick the paper the um, the hanky becomes a little bit of a thick crumbly nature all right office headache is due to inflammation of which sinus frontal sinus is considered as a uh, office headache sinus because here only while you are in the office there is headache once you go back you are fine and that is because um there is build up over here uh, in the forehead uh, with the frontal sinus area all this edema and later on when you lie down and when you sleep it drains out into the middle meatus area so that's why frontal sinus is the office headache area adams apple in the male is due to thyroid cartilage extremely basic question is for time now waste karte hue let's move ahead all right some new guys have joined subhadeep is over here All right, most prominent and larger air cell of the ethmoidal sinus. Now, when you enter inside the nose, this is the septum. This is one nasal cavity. This is the other nasal cavity. You see the middle inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, and uh, when you remove the middle turbinate, you'll see the uncinate process. And before the uncinate process, you'll see one large cell that is called as the agar nasi cell, roughly present in only forty percent. of the population lateral to the agar nasi cell you will find the naso lacrimal duct all right so the agar nasi cell haller cell i told you l lag jate hain this is a orbital cell onodi cell is there in the sphenoid and bulla ethmoidalis is nothing but your uh, uh, when you go behind the uncinate process right so uncinate process and you will see the bulla the space between that is the hiatus semilunare and this whole thing is being covered by the middle turbinate so bulla ethmoidalis is a normal ethmoidal bulla it is not the first cell the agar nasi comes even more anterior so all of you uh, are correct over here is it agar nasi some of you uh, have put d also only jagdish babu and subhadeep are correct um uh, no only jagdish babu is correct subhadeep and dr pk have said d bulla ethmoidalis is not the first one all right so it is the agar nasi cell okay this agar nasi cell is the first one most anterior most ethmoidal cell treatment of choice for nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a radiation therapy all right because you're not going to be able to do any sort of surgery there all the way inside this trotter's triad and sinus of morgagni and all the way it is too much close to the skull base basically a combination of radiation therapy and chemotherapy but radiation therapy or radiotherapy is the mainstay of treatment for most upper airway uh you know diseases uh, the cancers now a 6 year old boy comes home okay somebody had asked this difficulty in swallowing left tonsil is pushed medially and had swelling over the left side of the part of neck now see each of these has a very characteristic presentation in peritonsillar abscess you will have hot potato boys okay and you will have the uvula touching the tonsil all right retropharyngeal abscess you will on the x ray you will see that there is widening of the prevertebral space and there will be strider strider will be inspiratory there will also be fever Ludwig's angina the tongue 
will be lifted up like a double tongue appearance because the floor of the tongue will be elevated only in parapharyngeal abscess will you see that the tonsil on either side moves to the midline because this parapharyngeal space is the one which is affected all right your hot potato voice and uvula to one side this is all peritonsillar abscess or quincy retropharyngeal abscess has got increased prevertebral space and ludwig's angina is having the floor of the tongue being elevated double tongue appearance so parapharyngeal is all these four are questions guys all these four are questions and they will give you one very specific hint and it is very very easy to answer these all right so those who answered correctly that's good angiofibroma bleeds profusely because i have already answered this before so i won't waste time because it the vessels lack contractile component it lacks elastic fibers it is not able to you know control the bleeding and that's why in juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma the bleeding is so much all right now otomycosis most commonly caused by this i will leave it to you guys tell me what is the answer for this otomycosis is most commonly caused by okay akshat you are answering correctly for the previous one angiofibroma now otomycosis which is most commonly asked this is the most commonly asked question about fungus most commonly asked question about fungus so what is the most common cause for otomycosis fungal infection of the ear yeah dr pk is saying b akshat is saying b yeah so you are right aspergillus niger is the most common all right not candida albicans many of many people think it is candida albicans so swadeep you are right aspergillus niger is the most common aspergillus niger like i said is septate hyphae in acute angle less than 90 degrees uh, is what you will see on histopathology all right um and this is the most common black black color spores symptoms are itching extreme itching is the main symptom okay candidia says albicans will be a, is a yeast infection seen in very humid areas generally in the immunocompromised okay dicks help okay halpike maneuver dicks halpike maneuver is done for it is done for vestibular function specifically posterior semi circular canal so take the patient head make them lie down and turn it towards one side you start seeing torsional vertigo and that is dicks halpike this is only a trigger test it is only to see whether it is posterior semi circular canal is involved if dicks halpike maneuver is positive then the treatment for it is epley's maneuver so this small small otolith or otoconia that has now entered into the posterior semicircular canal from the utricle and that's why it is causing a lot of irritation and that's why dicks halpike is a diagnostic test for vestibular function life saving muscle of vocal cords already asked already done once posterior cricoarytenoid it is the only abductor supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve you can see the number of times the same questions repeat in fmg if you do this pyqs and these commonly asked questions you will sail through it especially the ent questions fairly easily all right you don't have to spend uh, time reading too much of other things they have one pool of questions usi mein se wo log ghuma phira ke puchte rehte hain mikulic cells and russell bodies are seen in so this is another common question um, these are large foamy cells macrophages and russell bodies are inclusion inclusion bodies okay this is very classical of rhinoscleroma woody nose caused by klebsiella rhinoscleromatis okay rhinosporidiosis it is caused by rhinosporidium sibri strawberry nose ponds bath somewhere outdoor bath will be there rhinophyma is seen in uh, acne rosacea and rhinitis can be seen either as allergy or inflammation All right, so this is fairly, fairly straightforward. Rhinoscleroma, mucolytic cells, and Russell bodies 
Sometimes they show it like this. Sometimes they show it uh, a histopathological image. But uh, rhinoscleroma is the answer for this question. So uh, Subhadeep is correct. Dr. Peek is also okay. Young's operation for atrophic rhinitis. We already covered this. Toby air test. Does anybody know what is Toby air test? And what is it done for? Toby air's test is done for this condition in which they ask some questions also uh, quite commonly, which is lateral sinus thrombosis. Okay, Lateral sinus thrombosis is a condition where you have picket fencing fever. And Toby Ayer's test is basically what, what is happening is if one side, the lateral sinus is blocked, it is thrombosed. Then if you are pressing the, the jugular veins on that same side, you're basically placing a lumbar puncture. Okay, so this is done under lumbar puncture. And you're looking for CSF pressure, whether it increases or decreases. Now, the, when you are pressing the neck, the jugular veins of the same side, side, you will not see any change in CSF pressure. But when you do the opposite side, there is no place for the CSF to drain and the CSF pressure increases, which is seen by increase in the drop rate of the lumbar puncture. And that confirms that one side lateral sinus thrombosis has occurred. You also see the Grissinger sign. Uh, Griezmann syndrome and Grissinger sign also over uh, over here. All right. Most common manifestation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Now, this is a trick question. What is the most common manifestation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Sometimes they will ask you something very, very simple and you will think, yeah, it's not simple answer. Nahi ho sakta hai. And then you get, uh, you know, confused. So what is the most common sign or most common manifestation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma? See, this is the trick over here. All of these occur, okay? So, Akshat, Jagdish Babu, Suhadeep, all of these occur. Epistaxis also occurs, headache also occurs, nasal obstruction occurs, cervical lymphadenopathy occurs. But think about it. There is a mass in the nasopharyngeal area. So, one of the most common presentations that is going to be is going to be of nasal obstruction. All right. In nasopharyngeal carcinoma, unlike nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, the bleeding is not such a prominent or an early symptom. Okay, because this is a kind of a you know, uh, it's a, it's a very well capsulated kind of a tumor. It's not like that red fleshy bleeding angiofibroma. Cervical lymphadenopathy occurs, but it occurs a bit later. It is not the most common presentation. Nasal obstruction will hundred percent be there in every case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Right, because nasopharyngeal obstruction. So when the when uh, there is a mass in the nasopharynx, you won't be able to breathe anything. Just like this is the most common presentation for adenoid hypertrophy also. All right, this can be the most common manifestation of uh, angiofibroma, but angiofibroma bleeds profusely, so patients usually present with epistaxis. Nasopharyngeal uh, uh, carcinoma people don't present with epistaxis; they prevent present with nasal obstruction in elderly age. Fifteen-year-old male, fever for two days. Unable to swallow, muffled or hot potato voice. On examination, noted that the right tonsil is shifted to midline. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis here is peritonsillar abscess. We have already gone through all of these, or Quincy. Okay. Adam's apple in boys. Ye har panch dus bano thyroid cartilage puchte rehte hain. I don't know why FMG wants to know why man have this Adam's apple. Okay, so that is. Correct. 35 year old female presents with tinnitus vertigo fullness in ear. This is a classical triad of a particular condition where you have episodic vertigo, episodic tinnitus. I think that is the only, um, you know, word that is missing over here. And uh, this would point uh, towards menius disease. Now, because they've just written otosclerosis over here, 
this is not fitting it but otherwise uh, females have higher predisposition to otosclerosis and it will cause largely ear blockage conductive hearing loss but if it is cochlear otosclerosis which is also a type of otosclerosis cochlear otosclerosis here the round window area and some parts of the uh, cochlear uh, you know basal turn of the cochlea will have uh, otosclerotic changes the membranes don't move in cochlear otosclerosis also you will see tinnitus vertigo and ear blockage or fullness in the ear but they've just mentioned otosclerosis to main jaane de raha hu other cochlear otosclerosis bol dete then that would be more likely because in a female uh, you know it's more common the otosclerosis but anyway here it is meniere's disease so you are right nothing to worry med student is also answered and uh, suadeep is also answered dr pk is also answered picket fencing fever we just covered right now lateral sinus thrombophlebitis see i have not edited out the pyqs because i want you to understand how much they keep repeating and recycling the same questions and the same options all right you will cover 60 to 70% of your ent questions by doing pyqs and rest is all basic questions that they typically ask which of the following muscles originate from the first pharyngeal arch this is a trick question okay so i am not going to answer this i am going to wait for you to answer which of the following muscles originate from the first pharyngeal arch over here yeah which of the following originates from the first pharyngeal arch so suadeep is saying a jagdish babu is saying a is it a akshat is also saying a hmm suadeep is also saying a udi baba ki ho re okay everybody akshat is also saying a jagdish also suadeep also okay guys no This is a, this is a trick question. You have been tricked. Okay. Now, pharyngeal arches. I'll explain to you very briefly. Each arch has a particular nerve that supplies particular things. You have to remember that. So, first pharyngeal arch, second pharyngeal arch, third pharyngeal arch, fourth and sixth. There is no fifth arch. Fifth arch is rudimentary. So, it is not. Doctor P K is saying D and Akshat is saying D. So, you have changed to stylopharynges. Okay. Actually, none of you are correct. I'll let me explain it to you. Okay. First pharyngeal arch. is for the maxillary nerve uh, sorry uh, so basically trigeminal nerve and trigeminal nerve there is two subsets of the first arch one is the maxillary division and other one is the mandibular division okay then this is the second one is the facial nerve the third one is glossopharyngeal nerve fourth one is superior laryngeal nerve and sixth one is recurrent laryngeal nerve now if you know the the nerves and the nerve pathway or which supplies each arch you will know which muscle is supplied by which and that is the derivative so think about it your malleus and incus malleus and incus are supplied by the first arch your stapes is supplied by the second arch all right similarly over here your stapedius muscle cannot be the answer because stapedial muscle is supplied from the second arch right now the trick over here stylopharyngeus is supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve all right so that is third now the trick that they are trying to do is play on anterior belly and posterior belly of digastric now anterior belly and posterior belly of digastric has a very interesting nerve supply so if you look at the mandible all right and you have the anterior belly of digastric and then the posterior belly of digastric the posterior belly is supplied by facial nerve but the anterior belly is supplied by the mandibular nerve mandibular division of trigeminal nerve and this is how they trick you because you will think digastric muscles both are supplied by facial nerve only posterior supplied by facial nerve anterior belly of the digastric is the only muscle over here supplied by the first pharyngeal arch because it is supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve it is just below the uh, mandible they also trick you in another question they will put they will say which of the following arches uh, you know contribute to the foot plate of stapes and they will give one option none of the above and that would be correct because the foot plate of stapes if you look at the stapes 
the foot plate of stapes originates from the otic vesicle only the upper part of the stapes originates from the second pharyngeal arch these are the two areas of trick questions that most examiners are using and i think uh, you know you should be aware of this because it's very standard but here anterior belly of the digastric muscle is the correct answer all right so i hope you understood that dip at 4000 hertz in pure tone audiometry indicates two dips you have to learn in life one is the 2k other one is the 4k both make different diagnosis and they're commonly asked at 2k only bone conduction only bone conduction dip is otosclerosis at 4k bone plus air conduction dip is noise induced hearing loss okay in menias disease you have a upward sloping thing all right you have an upward sloping in menias disease you will not have a downward sloping age related hearing loss your hearing loss will be downward sloping high frequency hearing loss all right whereas in menias disease it will be upward sloping low frequency hearing loss all right so it's very very classic in these four particular conditions each one is an mcq of its own otosclerosis dip at 2k dip at 2k bone conduction this is also called as a carahart's notch in menias you have sleep yeah upward so swadeep is right 2k is for uh, otosclerosis 4k is for noise induced hearing loss menias disease is upward sloping uh, and noise induced hearing loss is for your uh, 4k dip for both bone and air and age related hearing loss is because of nerve weakness that's why they can't hear high frequency hearing loss right they can't hear kids and uh, you know people with high frequency screaming they cannot hear so they usually very happy people whereas menias disease what happens is menias disease is because of the increased pressure inside the inner ear and when this increased pressure inside the inner ear the basal turn so in cochlear you have the apex and you have the base the base is high is basically of low frequency and the apex is high frequency no no sorry the base is the basal turn is high frequency and the apex is low frequency now what happens is when there is increased pressure the space is less in the apex that's why you have low frequency hearing loss first in noise induced hearing loss the damage is taken at the base first because of too much of pressure of sound that is coming the sound waves pressure is too much high so that's why the base gets injured first so you have high frequency hearing loss in menias disease it is like it is like hypertension of the cochlea so there is much lesser space this cochlea is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller as you go to the apex so even little bit of pressure increase is causing damage to the apex so you have low frequency hearing loss this is the funda easy to remember okay continuous watery discharge from nose after trauma is also csf rhinorrhea they keep asking the same thing again and again which of the following structures used as landmark for facial nerve in parotid gland surgery okay this is a surgical question we is a tragal pointer we use a lazy s incision where if this is the ear and this is the parotid gland we make a lazy s incision like this and this tragal pointer this tragus that you can see over here this tragal pointer when just under that 1 cm below the tragal pointer you will see the facial nerve you know uh, division all right helix is on the top is not tip of the helix styloid process is behind in the mastoid that is where the facial nerve exits and not posterior border of mylohyoid so tragal pointer is the answer in this case mainstay of treatment of glue ear this also has been asked it will be meringotomy uh sorry uh main ha uh, glue ear yeah glue ear would be meringotomy and uh, aeration to the middle ear that is basically saying grommet insertion after making an incision here also they ask two types of questions okay now when somebody is having an acute suppurative otitis media asom and there is build up of fluid that time you make a cruciate incision in the posterior inferior quadrant okay because 
you want when the patient is lying down all the fluid to evacuate and then close on its own after the inflammation infection subsides whereas in glue ear which is acute otitis media no infection all right here you will put the grommet in the antero inferior quadrant because this is going to be there for 3 to 6 months and this is the safest area the anterior inferior quadrant does not have any important structures vikash chandra aapka kya vichar hai kis bare mein bhai to so mainstay of treatment over here is meringotomy and aeration of middle ear okay aapka kya vichar hai oh three times written like mcqs saddle nose deformity due to bony erosion is caused by which of the following again like i told you this bony and cartilaginous thing they keep asking again and again again they are asking in a different way so remember Wegener's granulomatous causes bony uh, perforation along with syphilis okay tuberculosis cartilaginous leprosy cartilaginous cat scratch doesn't cause anything into the nose they've just put it over there so here, saddle nose deformity due to bony erosion will be caused only by vaginous granulomatosis or syphilis. Okay. All right. Now, which of the following is a drug of choice for facial nerve palsy? Now, generally we think, okay, when there is facial nerve palsy or any nerve palsy, you will give some antiviral drug like acyclovir or, but in this case, Whenever facial nerve is there and facial nerve palsy occurs, that time the first treatment that you would like to give is prednisolone or steroids because it is usually due to some sort of edema or inflammation. So for that some sort of edema or inflammation, you're basically going to do, uh, you know, give a prednisolone or a steroid. Okay. Bulla ethmodalis drains into which of the following? Middle meatus, repeat question. Which of the following is known as artery of epistaxis? All right, so Palak Kajal has written D, prednisolone, that is correct. Akshat is D, Suradeep is uh, D, that is also correct. All right, you guys are correct. Now in this, which of the following is known as artery of epistaxis? Very straightforward um, question over here. Dr. P.K. Singh, rocking sir. P.K. to aap baithe hain. So, uh, you know, uh, that is the, the thing. Um, which of the following is the artery of epistaxis, guys? Jagdish Babu, sphenopalatine artery, yes, it is the artery of epistaxis. We ligate the sphenopalatine artery. Akshad, Buzz Light here, you're all correct. So, it's maybe we don't have to waste time. All right. Now, there's one thing over here, okay. Uh, Palak is also correct. JD Boss, wah, that's also correct. Sometimes, okay, some books and some people in their notes, they say posterior ethmoidal artery is not a part of the Little's area. See, Little's area or the Kesselbach's plexus in the front of the septum has anterior ethmoidal artery, posterior ethmoidal artery, then you have supralabial artery, and you have the greater palatine artery and the sphenopalatine artery. These are the five arteries that form the Kesselbach's plexus. Some books say that posterior ethmoidal artery is not a part of this Little's area. All the recent literature says that the watershed part of this is also contributing. So any updated examiner will not ask this question. But if the examiner is not updated and they give you such a question, then you select posterior ethmoidal artery. But otherwise, for your clinical knowledge, that is not true. All the five blood vessels contribute to the Little's area. A child is brought to OPD with sudden onset breathlessness, but no significant history is given by the parents. This is a big clue over here. Whenever parents have no clue what is happening, child has put something inside his or her body. That is a very, very classical clinical symptom or history that we usually find. So the moment they're saying child has got sudden breathlessness, but did not have any cold, did not have any injury, did not have anything, just suddenly became breathless. So this means ne kuch kiela hai, and that is usually a foreign body obstruction and urgently we have to evaluate for it. It can acute epiglottitis, croup and pneumonia will not occur suddenly. Okay, there will be one or two days of history, some fever, some cough, something like that. Idea in your parents go to Kusto Bachena Mume Dala, Nakma Dala, you know, something like that, and it has gone inside the airway. So the answer is A, and the, that is the, the hint to it. Now, a 54 year old male presented with nasal obstruction, there is irregular unilateral grape like mass on the posterior wall of nasopharynx. 
what is it grape like massy whenever they give this word like grape they are basically telling something polypoidal okay and here the only thing that is uh, option of polypoidal would be antroconal polyp if they would have given instead of rhinoscleroma rhinosporidiosis then okay maybe but they've also said nasopharynx right rhinosporidiosis will fill the entire nasal cavity like a strawberry nose antroconal polyp is a polyp that comes from the antrum it comes from the uh, middle meatus and goes all the way to the nasopharynx so it is an antroconal polyp you guys are right uh we have Pilla Shravani, we have Swadeep, Jagdish Babu, Akshat, all of you guys are answering correct. Thea Roll Child, acute respiratory infection. Oh, I think this is, I think, one of the last few questions. According to the mother, is mouth breathing, snoring, suffering from hearing impairment. The moment hearing impairment comes, adenoidectomy and grommet insertion. Last five or six exams, mein ye char bar to ye aa chuka hai. that much, that frequently they repeat it. I'm trying to give that message to you. All right, so guys, this is the end of the session. Thank you guys for lovely, um, you know, engagement. And uh, uh, now at uh, PW, I'm also recording a 2.0 version where we are going to have a lot more details and a lot more uh, interesting, uh, you know, exam oriented as well as your professional exam oriented, uh, you know, things. So all of you are right, JD Boss, Suadeep, end at a high note. All of you have got, uh, you know, C. And uh, this is the schedule for, uh, you know, the rest of, uh, you know, your spotlight. So I hope, uh, you know, this was useful and uh, we'll touch base uh, again next time, either in a live session or you can watch my online videos. But thank you very much. Signing out. Take care. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section after the live is over and I will answer it um, in some way or the other. All right, guys. Take care. Signing out. Jagdish Chaturvedi. Good night. Bye-bye.